Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. We're glad you're with us. We're here every week. We meet interesting people and deal with topical issues and an age-old issue today and an old friend in town. Indeed. We're going to be talking about uh, law, constitutional law, and with somebody who knows a lot about both. Uh, judge Bill Graves, Honorable Bill Graves, a district judge in Oklahoma County is going to join us today and talk about kind of what's going on in the, at the district court, what life is like being a district judge. He has authored a new article on constitutional law and how he, in the world he has time to do that, I've not <laughs> figured out, but it's always good, well written and uh, well documented. And we're pleased to, uh, very much that he could come visit with us and spend some time. I know how busy he is. Bill Graves, today's guest on The Verdict. We'll be right back. fortunate enough to premiere every film that I've produced at Sundance. Seeing your film on the big screen for the first time in front of an audience at the Sundance Film Festival is unmatched. I'm Chad Burris. I'm an attorney, a film producer, film financier, economic development financier, and I'm Chickasaw. Nobody can argue that modern day media, cinema, has perpetuated this myth, this idea of the Indian and what that is. And just the idea that, you know, all Indians look one way or all Indians act one way is a terrible injustice. Being able to have filmmakers tell stories that are representative of some element of his surroundings, his upbringing, what they know, what they see through their own eyes, that other people get a chance to bear witness to um, around the world. I think that's amazing. For me personally, being an Indian today means being responsible, honest, progressive, and giving that back to the community. Learn more about today's Chickasaws at Chickasaw.tv. People have been talking about energy independence for a long time. It's always been popular, but today it's possible. We have an enormous supply of oil and gas in the United States, much more than we thought just a few years ago. New technology, massive new discoveries, largely made by Oklahoma companies. It literally changes everything. And Oklahoma is leading the charge. Go watch this video to see why. Energy independence starts with us. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today, as I indicated in the opening segment, we're honored to have uh, the Honorable Bill Graves, uh, District Judge Oklahoma County, on with us for his second appearance on The Verdict. Judge Graves uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma, did his law work at Oklahoma City University. He's had a good combination of law practice and uh, professional and public service, served in the House of Representatives for 24 years in a number of positions. Uh, he has been a district judge now in Oklahoma County for six and a half years. Uh, he is, uh, has time to uh, give uh, talks uh, to folks that want to hear him talk about the Constitution. He's known around Oklahoma County as being someone particularly knowledgeable about U.S. constitutional matters, and those folks are few and far between. Uh, he uh, has written an article <laughs> recently that we'll be talking about and uh, we're sure pleased you'd take time to come visit with us. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking me. It's an yeah. honor. Well, Judge, in general, what have you been doing lately? What's, what's been keeping your time? Well, aside from working at the courthouse, reading mm -hmm. briefs, that sort of thing. They're not so brief, though, I found out, <laughs> as I knew before. Uh, all been, I'm a big football fan and baseball, watching the World Series. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, Who's your favorite? In the World Series. Well, I'm pulling up the Cardinals. They're not doing so well. <laughs> going to have to rally. Well, they're going to have to rally. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's jump right into uh, the law review article that you've written recently uh, uh, dealing with the constitutional uh, matter, the Supreme Court's decision applying the Bill of Rights to the states or not. As, uh, why uh, did you uh, decide to write this article? What, what was your purpose in doing it? Well, I thought it was a uh, very important issue as far as uh, the power of the states are concerned. Of course, it was the states that uh, created the federal government, not the other way around. And it seems to me like we're going in a direction where we got kind of the tail wagging the dog. Not that uh, the federal government's the tail, but uh, they are, have more control over the states than the founding fathers intended. Uh, James Madison, who's known as the father of the Constitution, uh, 
said that uh, the powers of the federal government were only those enumerated in the Constitution, and uh, the states retained a inviolable sovereignty all over all the reserve powers. Uh, but with uh, the incorporation doctrine, we see that uh, uh, violated, and uh, I think we see the federal government usurping powers that shouldn't be theirs. Uh, let me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I wouldn't dare do that in court. I'd be going to jail if I did, but <laughs> again. But uh, what do you mean by incorporation doctrine? Just in real uh, layman's okay. terms, what do you mean by the incorporation Right, well, doctrine? that's a good question. Uh, when it, uh, as I'll point out eventually here, the founders intended for the Bill of Rights to apply only to the federal government. Well, the 14th Amendment was passed, and there uh, have been arguments, and finally they succeeded in saying that the Bill of Rights uh, applies, I mean, the 14th Amendment applies the Bill of Rights to the states. You call that a, a merger or an, an incorporation incorporated into the the 14th Amendment. So the Bill of Rights uh, up till recently had, had been held to be applicable to the federal government, but not necessarily the states. And this recent decision says, no, 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 the, by virtue of the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights is now equally applicable to states as well. Is that right, about that's, where we are? Right. It, and uh, that's the topic you're talking about. Right, that's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, Justice Story said uh, in his commentaries on the Constitution that the whole matter of religion was left to the states, and uh, but with incorporation, even though the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, doesn't right. include the states, uh, we have the states, uh, the federal government usurping really the powers over religion, and uh, as well as criminal justice, uh, education, uh, you know, even abortion and same-sex marriage could be in the same category. Well. Did you look at the at, at anything to try to determine what was the intent of Congress in creating the Bill of Rights? Yes. Why was it uh, created in the first place? Right. Uh, well, the, the after the Constitution was enacted, there were many of the states were concerned about that the federal government would be endanger some of the liberties the states and the citizens had, so they petitioned for a Bill of Rights, and the Congress responded. And uh, we have, that's what we have now. And, uh, but they, in the argument <clears throat> in, in Congress, uh, it was going to apply only to the federal government. But James Madison, I mentioned a while ago, he wanted to apply part of it to the states, like freedom of conscience, protection for that, as well as freedom of the press and trial by jury. But that was rejected because they just wanted it to apply to the federal government only. Uh, then uh, in 1833, uh, Barron versus Baltimore, pretty famous case, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall held that the Bill of Rights uh, applied only, a provision of the Fifth Amendment, applied only to the federal government, not the states. And one reason he said that, or held that, because there was no enumeration saying that it applies to the states. Mm -hmm. And it being a government enumerated powers, that's what they held. And of course, the Tenth Amendment, uh, you know, kind of says uh, if you didn't believe it's the first time, we really mean it. <laughs> you only have the powers delegated in the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, that's a summary of what the Tenth Amendment right, says. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what brought about the controversy that, uh, if you recall, that uh, caused the uh, incorporation doctrine to be applied to the Bill of Rights? Uh, this case that has come down right. that you're talking about, what was, what was that case about? The, uh, well, the, the McDonald case yes. uh, versus Chicago it involved the uh, gun, uh, gun law in mm -hmm. Chicago. and uh, It's relatively recent. Right, and so the first, Second Amendment, by the way, had never been held applicable to the states until the McDonald case, and it was, and uh, they upheld, uh, I believe, the uh, gun law in, in Chicago. As a result of that, uh, the uh, after the uh, the in the fourteen and the like, slaughterhouse cases that was decided about three years after the Fourteenth Amendment came to law, the court uh, examined that. Of course, the the provisions in the uh, section one that's mainly what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. It provides that uh, the states can't. Uh, uh, you know, uh, deprive the person, uh, U.S. citizens of 
the uh, sovereign immunities. And uh, then it talks about the state cannot take life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Mm -hmm. And uh, that eventually became the basis for incorporation. But after that decision, I think it went along for 50 years until uh, maybe longer than that. They had the uh, Gitlow case in 1925, and uh, they held it the, without even any oral argument. That this astounded Charles Warren, the famous historian of the Supreme Court, that they said that, that free speech was incorporated and applied to the states by, through the 14th Amendment. So uh, anyway, uh, it's interesting that after, uh, the, during the debates on the 14th Amendment, there was a, a John Bingham, the chief author of the amendment, wanted to have a, an amendment that would have really given the Congress the powers of a super legislature over the states and it had some of the same powers that they have by incorporation. Well, this was just flat out rejected by both houses. And uh, if Bingham was, uh, John Bingham was only one of two persons, a member of the House or the Senate in the 39th Congress that said, urged that the 14th Amendment would incorporate the Bill of Rights. But he was confused over many things. Uh, and he, he, he equated uh, the Bill of Rights, not with the first eight amendments of the Constitution, but the uh, Privileges and Immunities Clause and the protections of due process. Well, what do you think explains the apparent change of thought that the Supreme Court's had about the incorporation doctrine? Well, uh, as I said, we've been along for a long time and uh, without incorporation, but uh, I think it, uh, I hate to say it, they maybe just wanted that power over the states, mm -hmm. the, the sovereign states. And, but isn't the makeup the And we got a lot of, I think, liberal judges during the, after FDR was in office, and then with the Warren Court, and that's when it mainly happened. Well, do you, do you take any solace, or are you fearful of the current makeup of the court, and what the current court might do when faced with that proposition again. Well, I got more confidence in certain, certain individual members than I do others. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell who's in the majority in the I just always court. regretted Robert Bork didn't get on the court, but uh, we got Anthony Kennedy instead, and he's kind of going both ways. He's, he can be on either side yeah. of those issues. <laughs> I thought he was totally right on Obamacare. <laughs> well, when we come back, uh, we're not going to be talking any more about this uh, unless you have something else to say about it, but I think Mick's got to get us to a break here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bill Graves, our guest, will be back with more on The Verdict. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you.
and welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers we're and our guest, the, the Honorable Mick Bill Graves. Uh, Your Honor, well, I do want to go back just for a minute to Bill the Graves. article that you've written uh, because it's going to be published. It's going to be part of our legal lore uh, in the future here in the spring probably. Uh, you do spend some time talking about substantive due process. Can you tell our viewers that uh, may not be quite as familiar with it as you, what do you mean by substantive due process, and could you give us an example? Okay. Uh, I might tell you what distinguishes it from procedural due process. Please do. Procedural due process is what was really intended by the framers of the Constitution, and uh, under the common law, which we adopted, you know, as part of our Constitution, uh, procedural, it meant procedural due process, such as giving notice, mm -hmm. uh, providing a judge, the arbiter to try the case, presenting evidence, uh, things like that are, are procedural due process. And uh, Justice Story, and early on, in U.S. versus Smith said that one of the common law terms used in the Constitution, it maintains the common law meaning. So to change that uh, into substantive due process, which uh, you know, and Alexander Hamilton, the Federalist, said that uh, due, uh, due process of law referred only to procedures in courts, not referring anything to an act of a legislature. And that, by substantive due process, it allows the courts to determine policy, uh, whether that was a good policy the legislature used in enacting a law, or, uh, uh, or just maybe they just don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, where, where do you think we are then? Do you think we're, we're stuck with this interpretation until it comes before the court again? Well, it'll have to be. I, th I think there's uh, people on the court that don't subscribe to the substantive due process, including Justice Thomas. I think Scully is of the same mind, and I'm not sure what the others think, uh, uh, but they, they use that in applying the Second Amendment to the states in the McDonald case. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, uh, substantive, or, uh, substantive due process had been rejected early on in the slaughterhouse cases. Is that they, they argued on privileges and immunities as well as... And they don't overrule it or distinguish it or anything? Uh -uh. No, they never just discussed overlook that. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they decided, in a, based on a law, a law review article by Charles Fairman in 1959, that the Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states at all. Justice Frankfurter wrote the decision. And they said Fairman's article was conclusive, and but they since that time they went embraced incorporation again, but have never mentioned Barkus in any of these cases. Well, we may see your article, and, and they don't, about. and they never explained why Fairman's <laughs> article was no longer conclusive. <laughs> uh, well, I started to say we may see his article in print and uh, followed by the Supreme Court here in the future. <laughs> Let's switch gears for a moment. Right. You, you do mainly civil cases, right? right. Uh -huh. and do you have a preference between civil and criminal? Well, I've handled both. Uh, first uh, year and a half or over, I was on the court, I was had handled criminal cases, then I handled probate, then I hadn't been handling uh, the uh, civil cases since 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, didn't, I like them both. Uh, I enjoyed them. Uh, the, the, uh, the, frankly, the criminal cases are a little, docket's a little easier. Uh, I, I enjoy working with the criminal lawyers. And uh, on the civil docket, you're, you had to do tort cases, as personal injury and contracts, uh, receiverships, injunctions, all that sort of thing. And, and name changes. Uh, <laughs> I think I had a famous name change case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, recently. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, what do you think, Judge, generally speaking, uh, about the wisdom of requiring district judges to run for election, run for uh, their position by standing for election, and the uh, necessary requirement for campaign contributions to be solicited and that sort of thing? Is that a problem? Well, I, for me it was, not. that's how I got elected, or got on the bench, mm -hmm. uh, was by election, and uh, I, of course I've was in the legislature, served mm -hmm. 24 years, so I had to win 12 elections there. And uh, I, I think it's a, a good idea for judges to be subjected to the voters. Mm -hmm. And I think, really, the voters ought to be a part of this process. Uh, I don't think it ought to be left up to a panel of lawyers. And we do have laymen on the 
yeah. nominating commission, but I'm, I would think they're influenced greatly by the lawyers on it. But uh, I think uh, it's a good idea. You know, in Alabama, they had Judge Roy Moore was chief justice, and he, God forbid, put up the Ten Commandments, you know, as a monument. And he got in trouble over that, and they said it's unconstitutional. And finally, they ran him off the bench. Well, here just recently, he ran for chief justice because they can elect the, the, down in Alabama, and he got elected. <laughs> so the people reversed him. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate authority. Right, yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> what uh, is your caseload like? I mean, you're, I know you're busy, and I know you've got a... Oklahoma County has a heavy docket. Approximately how many cases at any given time would you have? I, I think we, you know, a week we handle around 60 cases or more. Uh, I think there's about uh, close to a thousand cases still listing. We'd probably call some of them out that hadn't, they're not doing anything on. Yeah. We will do that. Probably cut it down somewhat. But uh, it is a, a very big caseload, and it it's bigger than the, what you have in the rural counties. And uh, I would wager you it's a lot bigger mm -hmm. than what they have in federal court for judges up there. What's the reason for the for the increased caseload? Our litig litigious society, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> just, just more being filed. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, uh, I, we seem like there's more of them settled since we've had kind of economic spiral going down a little bit, but uh, maybe not so much in Oklahoma as there's other places. Do you have a requirement in your courtroom uh, for a mandatory settlement conference or a mandatory mediation or something like that to try to get the case settled before you have to decide it? Not really. I, uh, we, I, if they want to go to mediation, I'd let them do it. Usually a, uh, I don't require any kind of mandatory settlement commerce. Uh, a lot of them, are, they just settle them on their own. And it seems like mo a lot of them are. Well, particularly the cases you handle and the other judges that have the civil docket handled are sometimes heavy in paperwork and a lot long briefs and uh, right. a lot of reading. And uh, your staff consists uh, does not consist of having a law clerk to assist you, as I understand it, at the district court level. Right. How helpful would that be if you had such a clerk? Well, that reminds me, when I was in the legislature, I had judges come out wanting law clerks. I wish I'd have paid more attention. <laughs> <laughs> Reap what you sow right, or something yeah, like sure that? Yeah, sure does. Uh, that would be a, an immense help to have a, at least one clerk. You know, the federal judges have, have two apiece at least, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't as I said, I don't think there are caseloads anywhere near as what it is in Oklahoma County civil docket. So it uh, it would be a, certainly a help because uh, uh, you could really be uh, have more time on cases than you mm -hmm. do now. There's so many you got to decide them pretty fast. And uh, I I take stuff home quite a bit to read and, and uh, work on weekends and. Uh, uh, but it, it uh, I'm learning more, a lot more about the law than I ever thought I'd really want to, but <laughs> you have to. <laughs> well, if we just have about 45 seconds left. Uh, if you could change one thing about the system in which you're now functioning as a district judge, make one significant change uh, that would assist the administration of justice, what would that be? Well, I think it'd be uh, like the subject we're talking about, getting some law clerks. And I think a lot of judges would feel the same mm -hmm. way about it. It would make it allow it to work through the system more quickly? Right. And it be you have more help because you, you, we have lawyers brief the cases and most of them do a good, really good job on it. But uh, sometimes they don't, but uh, it'd be have, good to have law clerks to help you in this regard. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have that, so you kind of got to be your own law clerk. Somebody suggested some of the, I had an OCU law student do some work for me. And mm -hmm. She did a terrific job, so I probably ought to do more of that. All right. <laughs> Judge Bill Graves, our guest today on The Verdict. Judge, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having Thanks me. for your service to the county. Well, thank you. Kent and I will have a final word when we get back. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. 
When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we can help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. And welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers were wrapping up the show today. The Honorable Bill Graves, District Judge in Oklahoma County, was our guest. Yes, Judge Graves uh, does an awful lot of work in the constitutional law area. Is really known among those who pay attention to it uh, as being a, a scholar in that area. And how he is able to combine the very strenuous workload on the district court bench with keeping up with scholarship outside uh, scholarship in the law, but outside the cases he's handling is, is really a marvel to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he juggles so many things at one time. Uh, he uh, did discuss the article that he's going to be, uh, uh, that he's written and that we talked about today. It's going to be published in the Regent University Law School Journal of Law and Public Policy. That's the Regent Journal of Law and Public Policy in spring of uh, 2014. I commend it to you. I think you'll find it interesting to read. He's, he's, a, he's a very good writer and mm -hmm. makes the Constitution uh, very understandable. All right. Well, we have uh, uh, another guest coming up next week, but I want to remind you about our website, theverdict.tv. You can log on our website and tell us about a guest that you'd like to see on an upcoming show or a subject that you'd like to see discussed. And I really want to thank Bill Graves for coming on. We'll see you next week.